Thank you, Rusty, and good morning. We are here to give an ear to the letters of the seven churches, specifically this morning to Thyatira. We're on the fourth letter of the seven. And so when I think about the blessing of all seven, I immediately think of Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20 when Jesus says, And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He tells this to the eleven disciples because Judas has already died. And after he's given them the commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is before the church was established. But Jesus said, Behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, how was Jesus with them to the end of the age? That, that's still today. Jesus is still with us. And I immediately think of Acts chapter 9 when Saul was persecuting this brand new church called the Way. The, the, the disciples had developed the church that God had given through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus appears to Saul on the road to Damascus. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus says, He's persecuting not just the way, he's persecuting Jesus. Because Jesus is the head of the body. And so Jesus is so, so, uh, sees so much importance in the church that he recognizes the church as himself when he says, why are you persecuting me? And so here with these seven letters to the seven churches, this is after Jesus' ascension into heaven. This is through the Holy Spirit by the hand of John. That Jesus is giving these letters. And so this shows that Jesus is with them. This shows that Jesus is with us. And what we glean, what we learn from these letters will help you and I. Just as if this is all seven represent one letter to the church. Deerfoot Church of Christ. So when we, we look at this letter specifically. I'd like to look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. And let's begin with this this address to them. It says, The angel of the church in Thyatira write. The words, notice there's three different descriptions of who's, of who's writing, of Jesus. The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are, are, are like burnished bronze. Your, your version might have fine brass. These three descriptions are, are the same descriptions of the vision John saw in chapter 1 of Jesus. And if you'll recall, at the beginning of every letter, one of those descriptions, or in this case, three of those descriptions are given concerning Jesus. And they're foreshadowing for how the letter's going to go. They're foreshadowing for what's going to be said within the letter. So why is it important that this that this author, that Jesus, is referred to as the Son of God in Thyatira. Well, what's interesting in Thyatira, it's modern-day Turkey, but Thyatira was extremely supportive of Rome. They, they pledged allegiance to Rome, and they considered the Caesar a Son of God. They also considered the, the God Apollo as a son of God. So when Jesus is saying the son of God, he's saying I'm the only one. I'm the only begotten son of God. That one of our elders, John Gall uh, Gallagher, quoted this morning. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. And so he's trying to remind them I'm the only one. So maybe we're getting a glimpse of what they're struggling with in Thyatira. Notice it also says that he has eyes like a flame of fire. You know, we are very blessed. We have a light switch we can just flick and lights come on. And it's electricity that's been harnessed, but that's fire. So they didn't have electricity. Their concept of light was fire by night. And so what light did is it exposes darkness so that it can be seen, but also it would burn off impurities. And so eyes like flaming fire shows that Jesus knows. He knows the congregation at Thyatira. He knows where they are. And he's there to burn off the impurity that has established, been established there. So what we have here is in all four of the letters, we've had Jesus' knowledge of these congregations. Remember, he's with them always, even to the end of the age. 
So that means He knows even our congregation. He knows how we work. He knows just everything about us. And so we see here He knows their strength. So when we, we look at this, this is, we've seen in the last three that He knows their strength, He knows their sin, and He knows their solution. So all three of these are the points for the lesson. They, they have been the same, but the strengths of each congregation have been different. The sin of each congregation has been different, but the solution has also been the same. And so we're, we're going to be looking at their strength of this congregation in verse 19. He says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance that your latter works exceed the first. Well, if you'll notice, from verse 18, I failed to mention the, just the final description of Jesus. Feet like burnished bronze or fine brass. Well, I believe it has to do with the strength of the congregation. See, for, for, for bronze or burnished bronze or fine brass to be in the feet... It's a very strong alloy, a very strong metal. And so it, it means that they have strong feet. But the fact that it's not iron, it's not some kind of a strong steel, it, the fact that it is fine, refined brass or burnished bronze means it is strong feet for all to see. So that means that Jesus takes a stand for all to see. We see that in John chapter 2 when when he saw that, that the Pharisees had turned and the scribes had turned his father's house into a house of merchandise. And he made a whip of cords and he drove out the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus took a stand. His disciples saw zeal for his house had consumed him. Jesus was willing to take a stand. And so that shows that he has this refined brass in his feet. This is part of their strength. They had been willing to take a stand in Thyatira, the congregation had. So when he, when he says this, this, their works, he says he notices their works. Tonight, we're actually going to be looking at the lesson from verse 19. So we're going to spend more time tonight when it says, I know your works. Works of love, works of faith, works of service, works of patient endurance. But notice it says, and that your latter works... Exceed the first. Wouldn't you want to hear Jesus say this? You know, when you start out doing something, usually that's when you're more excited. When you start something new and it's, it's, it's brand new, therefore you're more zealous about it and, and work is, is, is harder or, or you work harder. Notice what he's saying. Your works, your latter works, the works you've done later are stronger than the works you did at first. That's a powerful thing. Wouldn't you want Jesus to say that about your work for the kingdom? I would want him to say that about mine. I would want him to say that we're, that we're all expending more energy even now, not just at the beginning, not just at the first. And so, in fact, the first letter to Ephesus was the, was the opposite. Verse 2 says, I know your works. Revelation 2, verse 2. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. And he says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So their works at the end were not as strong as they were at first. He said to repent and do the works you did at first. So the blessing for Thyatira is that they are working so hard for God in all of these areas that we will discuss tonight. So what was it in Thyatira that they were having to stand up against? Well, what's interesting is in, in Thyatira, because of archaeological evidence, we've been able to find that possibly the last names of members would have been Potter or Baker or Smith, because there were a lot of metal smiths in, in the congregation or in the, in the area of Thyatira. Could have also been Tanner. And we have some Tanners here tonight. Because they worked with leather. And, and so they also had wool workers and dyers. So they could have been called tailors. Who knows? Back when names actually meant what you did. 
We don't know about their last names. We know about what they did. This was a, an, a guild, a, a, a working community. And each of these specific guilds, each specific work or specific craft would have a guild that would be in charge of that craft. And so it's, it's just like today, if you, were, if you had your own business and you created a product, you would have to be able to find a market to be able to sell your product. I mean, today we have Amazon, we have Walmart. Anybody who has something wants to make sure that it gets on a shelf or it gets online so that it can be sent to the consumer. And so we have that same thing today. So during this time, if you wanted to be able to sell your your dyed objects, if, if your, your garments that had been made, if you wanted to be able to, to sell your leather works, if you wanted to sell your pottery or your baked goods, you had to be a part of a guild. You had to be a part of that market or you couldn't make money. You couldn't make a living. You'd starve. Now the issue that was going on in Thyatira was each guild had a god. Yes, a guild god. And what they would do is, for, for instance, if they were a part of this guild, they would actually get together and they would make sacrifices to these gods, specifically over pottery, for instance. And they would offer a sacrifice so that they could make a good income from that god that would hand them everything. And, and they would then take that meat and they would get together and they would eat that meat as a part of that guild. And so think about like a picnic for your company, but only it's a worship service. It's a, a gathering for a pagan worship. And so there's a, there is a catch-22 that these Christians in Thyatira are in. They would, it, they would have to be a part of a guild to be able to make money. But if they did so, they would be going against God in their worship to that God. But if they decided that they're going to follow God, then they couldn't be a part of the guild and they couldn't make a living and it was business suicide. How could they do this? They needed to make a stand. And it needed to be a stand with not, not this just with feet made of clay like we have in the picture in Daniel. This is a time where this needs to be a strong stand. It needs to be something that everybody sees that's going to be a challenge. And we are challenged with that today so much. We find so many comparisons to Thyatira today. But aren't we blessed, especially considering tomorrow, for our veterans? For those who have been willing to stand up for our freedom. And that we're able to be here this morning to worship freely. And that we don't have to... to, to, to to compromise in the way that Thyatira is challenged with. We're not faced with that kind of compromise today. Maybe to that extreme. But maybe because of the extreme that Thyatira is facing, we can face anything that would cause us to bow the knee to the gods of this day. To, to make sure that we're standing strong and people are seeing the light of Christ in our communities, and in this world. So, you know, it's interesting. We don't know the last names of these people, but we do know the first name of one of them. In Acts chapter 16, we meet Lydia. Lydia, who was from Thyatira. And if you'll recall, what did she do for a living? She was a seller of purple merchandise. So the dyers that were a part of the guilds in, uh, in Thyatira, they produced that purple cloth and she sold that purple cloth so this is something that's very important when she became a christian in philippi if if lydia were to come back move back home to thyatira she would be challenged in her business so you and i are challenged in the same way today are we willing to take a stand that's their strength they're willing to make a stand in the world but they weren't willing to make a stand within the church. Because Jesus knew their sin. In, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20 says, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice 
sexual immorality, and to eat food sacrificed to idols. The strength is that they are making a stand in the world, and, and later on we see that there are some that are not following this woman that's called Jezebel. Notice this is a, this is a, a figurative name. This is not her name. But it's hearkening back to Jezebel, who was the, the queen or the, the wife of the king Ahab of Israel. And what Jezebel was known for was killing the prophets of God and replacing them with prophets of Baal. So this is a woman that is considering herself a prophetess. I believe that's why she's called Jezebel. And what was Baal worship? We've, we've mentioned this with, with other letters Baal worship, she was, uh, Baal, he was the god of fertility. Asherah was the goddess of fertility. So it would be the same kind of worship, but with a different pagan name. Notice what was this prophetess teaching and seducing her ser the servants of Jesus to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So obviously this shows what kind of worship these guilds were doing as well. This was also... Uh, this was also sexual immorality for these gods. So it, talk about a challenge that they're facing in their world. But some of them are giving into it. Some are saying, well, that's just, that's just how it is. This is how it has to be. Or I'm not going to be able to make a living. And then they can also justify, well, I can also fill my stomach. I, I can also fill my, my lust. My passion, because that's just what is expected. I, I can do that. Well, you know, Thyatira sounds a lot like Corinth. If you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul was dealing with Corinth that was also a, uh, a port town that had so much influence just like Thyatira. They would have had a lot of goods from Thyatira in Corinth, for instance. They didn't produce the goods, but they were, because they were a port, that, that it all came there, and it was all trade and barter, and they had just as much wealth as Thyatira because of that. So look at the issues that they're facing. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. You know, today we would look at that and shudder. You know, how can a man have his father's wife? This is his, most likely his stepmother. We're going to give him that, that credit there. But I remember when I was a chaplain for the fire department in Kentucky, uh, a, a lady had a, a concern. She, she met with me right after. We were just standing right outside. the, the uh, She was a fellow fireman, and, and uh, she had an issue with her family she wanted con, you know, counsel for. And because I'm not mentioning names, I'll just say, she says, my brother and my dad aren't speaking to each other. And, and I say, well, this is your know, father's son. You know, what, what, you know, couldn't they possibly be able to overcome this? And he's like, well, no, because he's, he cheated with my father's wife. He, is, he has a relationship to my stepmother, his stepmother. And I said, well, that's biblical. I, I had a, I had a, I had a place to go. We went to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm telling you, this is going on today. This is going on all over the world. And it was going on in Corinth, but it was also going on, maybe not to this degree, but in Thyatira. Look at how Corinth was told by Paul. He says, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in the Spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my Spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So it shows why. Because Paul has concern for his spirit. Not for the flesh that he's giving into, but for his spirit, that it might be saved. He needs to be delivered over to Satan and actually see that what he's doing is of Satan, not of God. See, that's the problem. They're saying, look at how good we are. Look at, look at how far we've come. We're allowing even this to take place. But he's saying what this person is doing in the name of Christ 
is actually in the name of Satan. So he needs to be delivered to the one that he's following. And he needs to recognize he's not following Jesus. He's following Satan. He's not just following his own desires. He's following Satan. So he needs to be delivered to the one he's following so that he recognizes it. For the saving of his soul. Why? So he'll change. So he'll stop doing this horrible thing. Verse 6 says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So by allowing that to take place, then, well, you see, brother so-and-so is able to, to have this relationship with his mother. Then, then what I'm doing isn't nearly as bad. And that becomes a, uh, it becomes a justifier that Jesus never justified. And it's the concept of, of cancer. We don't want to let, let any cancer cells remain in our body, do we? Because they continue to grow and grow and grow to the point that it becomes a lump that has to be removed. In the same way, this is a lump that has to be removed. Cancer is it's horrible. And it has affected all of our families and all of us in some way. And this is cancer within the church. He says, cleanse out the old leaven. Remove it like surgery. Cleanse out that leaven that you may be a new lump. As you really are unleavened for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. We're to be different than the world. Even the pagans saw that that was horrible. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's saying, don't allow you know, malice and evil to be among you. He's saying, be sincere in truth. Not sincere in what your truth is or what you think is right. Be sincere in truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, then he says this, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. He's not talking about those in the world. Well, who's he talking about? But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, rival, rival, uh, reveler, drunkard or swindler not even to eat with such a one do we practice this today we live in a world that would say if you if you made any decisions on any of these that you were bigoted you yourself are evil so in a way we are challenged very similarly to Thyatira do we have feet that are like burnished bronze like fine brass, are we making a stand? This is hitting me right between the eyes. And this is a challenge for us today. Verse 12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? See, this is where if we just, let's go to Facebook, let's go to social media. What if we did that and we just started doing, you know, just, just denouncing all of this? Well, the thing is, you don't know who's, who's looking at it. People in the church, people in the world. It would be the wrong place for us to go to it. Because we can't represent Christ if we don't know who the audience is. We've got to recognize that he's talking about those within the church. Those who name the name of Christ, but are still doing all of these things. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. That's why we're to stand strong for Christ. So that those in the world will come to know Christ. And then he says, purge the evil person from among you. Well, it's interesting that back in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 22, this woman, she's going to cut herself off because of the decisions that she's making. Because of this specific nature of the sexual morality, it's going to cause her death. Look at verse 22. Behold, I will throw her, oh, verse 21, I gave her time to repent, Jesus says, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. 
You see, some are in the congregation in Thyatira, they're doing some incredible works. But obviously, those who are not doing those incredible works are doing the work of this prophetess. They're following her teaching, her, her immorality. And notice it's going to lead to her sick bed. You know, I, I have up here 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 18, Romans 1, 26-27. Ha- if, if you're following the notes, I had 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, it, but I wanted to make sure we just looked at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 18, if you'll turn there with me. What Paul is telling the, the brethren in Corinth concerning sexual immorality. He says, verse 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. So he's saying sin is sin that's outside the body. But sexual immorality is different. How so? But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body or her own body. Romans chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 actually tells us that, that those who, who traded what was natural for what was unnatural, women with women and, and men with men, look at the result Verse 26 says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error, receiving within themselves. You see, we live in a world that says you can't say these things are wrong. But if someone who sleeps around can get something called an STD, that is going to happen eventually. HIV is a result this is of, of this kind of impurity. They're receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. This is natural as a result. And so that's why I bring this up to say in Revelation chapter 2, if you look at the, the result, he's told, he's told Jesus has given her an opportunity to repent. She refuses to. I will throw her onto a sickbed. This is the result of what she is doing. The sickbed there is the concept of a stretcher or a gurney in a hospital. She's going to be sick. And those who've committed adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation. Well, the sickness is directly related to sexual immorality. And the, and the tribulation that those who commit adultery with her are receiving is directly related to sexual immorality. This is transmitted diseases through sexual immorality. Isn't it amazing that the scriptures handle this? This is not something we want to talk about. I almost want to limit our, uh, you know, ages within our audience. So I'm trying to be very careful with certain, just saying letters this morning. I gave her time to repent. Jesus doesn't want this to take place. But that's what's going to happen as a result of this sin. Unless they repent of her works. Notice it's what she came up with. And she's not willing to give, give in. The world has established just exactly how we're supposed to live. And, and if we said anything to the, to the contrary, if we just preach what the Bible has to say, it's hate speech so often in people's minds. But to Jesus, it's sin. Therefore, it's sin. And we've got to recognize that we've got to take a stand against it for the saving, not just of the flesh, but of the spirit, of the soul. I don't want anybody to get those kind of diseases. But I don't want anybody to, to go to hell over them. It says, verse 23 is a very challenging verse. And he says, And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches minds and heart, her, searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. So those who are doing works of love, faith, service, patient, endurance, he will give concerning those works. 
But those who are giving works according to this woman's work, they're going to receive the, the, the fruit of that as well. When it comes to the concept, I, I was reading a commentary that it's very possible the word children is referring to a figurative. Those who are following this prophetess. Those who are followers of her teaching, of her seduction. That they are going to die as a result of it. Can you imagine what they're facing as a result of that? They don't have any medication. We have medication today to be able to, to overcome some of these things. They didn't have it. And as a constant reminder that they need to follow Christ and Christ alone. So in the third place, Jesus knew their solution. Verse 24, it says, But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. He's saying, to those of you who have not given in to what this woman is teaching, he's saying, I'm not going to lay on you another burden. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep being patient. Keep being loving. Keep showing faith and service to Christ. That's the solution. Keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. The word for nations is referring to pagan Gentiles. So those who are trying to make a stand against Christianity in Thyatira, he's saying, if you conquer, if you remain strong, then it will come a day when you're the one that's in control as far as the strength is concerned. You will be able to conquer over this. And, and he says, verse 27 says, He will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Well, this is directly from Psalm chapter 2 and verse 8. And the quote, though, is from the Greek translation, the Septuagint of Psalm 2 verse 8. And the word used, I realize that was a lot of information there, for rule is shepherd. A shepherd with a rod is going to protect the flock. So those who remain strong are going to protect the flock. They're going to be able to ward off Satan. And if you do so, he says, I will give him the morning star. Notice it says, I myself have received authority from my father. Those of us who stand strong, we're, we've received the authority that Jesus has. And we can stand firm. We'll receive the morning star. This is referring back to the star that, that was in the sky when Jesus was born. And the Magi recognized it and they came to worship him. It, this, is, this, this is referring to Jesus. We will be able to be with Jesus for all eternity. When he says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I'd go to prepare a place for you. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you made a stand this morning? Are you standing firm, following Christ, regardless of what's going on in this world? The greatest stand that you can take is against Satan, against sin, confessing that Jesus is Lord, repenting, Repenting of your sins, meaning changing your mind concerning what the world thinks and what the Bible has to say. Being baptized in his name for forgiveness. Whatever your need is, won't you come while together we stand and while we sing.